So Nippon, we've had four days, four days in Canberra, remarkable. What would you like to talk about before we take you to the airport and you fly home? Fly home, or fly to meet Greg. Oh, fly to meet Greg Smith and then you go home. So <laughs> yes, that's It's right. a long way from home. What, what would you like to talk about? Um, I think, Rob, um, maybe the, maybe we should talk about, I mean, just take a step back and talk about what is social psychology of risk? What is social psychology of risk in your view? Let's just talk about that. Because you founded this whole idea mm. of social psychology of risk. Mm. So why not hear it from you? Yeah. Well, there are, there are ways you can see social psychology risk as a technical thing. And there are ways you can see it in a much broader, big, big view and that's the view I'll give. I see the social psychology of a risk as a as an orientation as a disposition in seeing the world. So we look at the world through not just social psychology but the sociality of humans. And so that becomes the lens with which we see the world. So it's sometimes helpful to state what social psychology is not. Social psychology is not human factors, behaviorism or engineering. In fact, it is probably the direct opposite of them. So behaviorism and uh, engineering and all of the so-called measurement sciences don't tackle the very realities of life which involve semiotics, poetics, social relationships, transcendence, meaning and purpose. If you're going to go into questions of meaning and purpose and you're going to about to embrace a discussion of say such things as metaphysics, that is completely foreign to those disciplines I discussed. Now it doesn't mean those disciplines are irrelevant. I depend on engineers like anyone else does. I want to make sure that my car has been engineered well. I want to know that the bridge I drive on has been engineered well. But I don't want to go to an engineer if I need counselling for a relationship issue. I don't want to go to an engineer if I want to know how to learn, how to listen and how to connect with people. And that's fine, we know our place. But the one doesn't work with the other. When I need a doctor for an ailment, I go see a doctor. And if I've got an electrical problem here, I call an electrician. And so social psychology of risk has a quite unique focus on life and on being that has roots in existentialism and phenomenology. And it doesn't see the world at all with that kind of traditional engineering measurement view. I don't discount that, but I actually think that the social psychology of risk worldview can coexist with the other worldview. When someone's child is run over on the road and they're suffering in hospital with a seven-year-old with tubes in and out their arms and they think they're going to lose their child. You don't go to an engineer to talk to. You might go to a doctor, but even the doctor may not be very good at understanding the anguish of the mother. So there are disciplines of great relevance which I think uh, come under the umbrella of social psychology of risk. Semiotics, semiosis, poetics, sociality, um, phenomenology. There are very, very valid studies under theology, religion, spirituality. There are very, very valid disciplines, just as valid as engineering. Because yeah. no you've only known me for a few years, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to tell me why you asked me originally about the social psychology of risk. What was it that drove you to the point? Because in my experience, you're quite a rare... Fine.
very, very few people will even send me a message and say, Rob, how do you understand culture? I'm interested in why you even asked the question and you contacted me and said, Rob, tell me what you know about social psychology. So what started in you? Um, well, as you know, I, I, I have a podcast which is called Embracing Differences. Yep. And uh, the starting point was, was really just to explore your perspective um, I never actually uh, go into any podcast with an agenda. And if you listen to my several podcasts, I normally don't even talk. I, I yeah. give control to the other person mm. because, you know, who am I to, to tell them that I know better than them yes. if I have invited them to my podcast? Mm. So yes. when I invited you, Rob, um, you spoke very passionately about uh, uh, your area of, mm. of work. Um, you not only... Uh, help me understand you also gave me some things to read yes, yes. Um, and I remember the first book that you uh, asked me to read which was metaphors we live by yes yes uh, and you sent me a copy of that book mm. um, and I think that was that was in some ways it was a reinforcement of uh, my my love for language mm. um, but I think in many ways you exposed me to to a way of thinking which I was drifting away from after doing my, my, my degree in anthropology. Mm. So you brought me back into the connection between language and culture that I'd almost uh, forgotten, yes. you know, because I did my PhD and then for four to five years, I drifted into uh, the, the contemporary uh, safety science and yeah, the yeah. emerging views around yes. safety. And I, in some ways you brought me back into it. And and as I started to become more interested in it, into it, and now I understand what you call the scaffolding, that you gave me more to read. And, yes. and every book I read, it made sense. Mm. Uh, I think if I look back at it, I, I, I cannot explain how I was drawn into it, but one thing that I particularly was very, very impressed with was that here is a worldview, here is a methodology, here mm. is a method, here is a tool to connect with people. Yeah, because yeah. I... I'll tell you what happened with me, and it, it, it probably makes a lot more sense now. I, I had a project, I did a project with Scottish government, mm -hmm. and I, I developed an app, an application. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yes, I mean, it was a huge project. It was, so I worked really hard for about two years, mm -hmm. and I was so naive to think that mm -hmm. People would just share their stories. I, I, I used to call them workers, but I don't anymore. People mm. would share their stories mm. on an app. Mm. And I thought that, you know, instead of a near-miss report, how good it would be if somebody was to share their story. Mm. So part of the project was working with about four big companies trying to understand how yeah. we could change reporting into yes. conversations. Yes. Yeah. And we got a lot of funding from the government and we worked really hard. And the first part of it was really powerful, which is deconstructing the problems with reporting, which we did well, I think, mm. looking back. But as we started to put it into an app, it failed miserably. Nobody would, nobody, and I know there are people who, who have an immense belief in, belief in technology and technology can really make things work. But what I realized we had only four or five reports in two years after trying so hard to get people to talk on technology. Mm. How naive to think that <laughs> people would share their experiences. And that was, that was powerful, Rob, mm. when, when, I, when I came to, to social psychology of risk and understood, I tried to understand what is it that really makes for a conversation. Mm. Mm. I was so naive yes <laughs> people don't give you anything no. if you approach from the position of a technique yes data analysis mm. prediction yeah measurement measurement yeah mm. and and so in a way it was a flawed approach uh, because there was no ethic yeah. behind or, the app yeah i mean i had good intentions yes I wanted people to share their experiences, but at the end of it, that sharing of experiences meant, first thing, businesses would gain value out of it. Mm -hmm. My eyes opened up when, on one occasion, I went on board a ship and I spoke to a, a, 
a seafarer on board an offshore ship and he said to me, he said, you come here to ask me how this lifeboat functions, how the process works and how, how I operate, how I work out the lowering of the boat. I'll tell you all that. But first, hear this. I've been on this ship, I've been on this ship for, for on this company for many, many years. Mm -hmm. We've never had this issue of income taxes. Seafarers don't get income tax because they live away from the ship for many, yeah. many months. Yeah, yeah. So we, we never have to pay income tax. And now the company says you have to pay income tax. And it's not, it's not small money, it's 30% of my wages. And then Rob, I started, I asked myself, I said, what is this nonsense? I mean, I'm here to understand what some people would say, work as imagined, work as done. Yeah, I'm trying mm. to understand, or mm. mind, uh, bridge the gap between the two. Why is he telling me all this about income tax? Hmm. I'm, I'm not interested in all that. I want to understand work. I want to understand safety. But I, I patiently listen. And I, and I don't know why, but I gave him my full attention. He went on for about seven to eight to ten minutes, and then more seafarers joined him. And they started to complain about it. Hmm. And it went on for about 20 to 25 good minutes. And then the magic happened. You know what he said to me? He said, Thank you for listening. Nobody listens. No. He said, and I still remember, he said, I don't expect you to solve any of this problem. I know you didn't come here to, to do this, but you listen. No, yes. Nobody listens. Rob, that was very powerful. And you know what happened after that? He said, come, I'll show you how I lower the lifeboat. Yes. And he spoke with passion. He told me everything about yes. the risks involved in lowering a lifeboat that are so far away from what the documented processes have to say. Yes. One after another experience, I watched the same pattern repeating. Mm. You have to become interested in people. You have to understand yes. the sources of decision making, yes. which is the unconscious mind. People will tell you amazing things if you just suspend your agenda yes. and submit control for a few minutes. Mm. And so the more I read, and you gave answers to that, not just through books, but through those wonderful semiotics that I could take, so small pictorials, small yeah, yeah, little yeah, leaflets, yeah. which I could take to seafarers, which I could take to companies <coughs> and say, here is a working model to achieve this. Yeah, it practice. works. Uh, yeah, it's a working. Yes. And yeah. and time after time, I, I experienced that, oh, yeah, yeah, yep. it sounds simple, but it works. Yep. So I'm, I'm not suggesting that I have reached a position where I have, you know, I've I understand everything. There's a long way to go. But I think understanding the science and art both of connecting with people yeah. is very important yes. if you want to improve the quality of decisions in your yeah. organization. And people don't know how to have conversations. No. They don't understand. And, and so, so to answer your question, it was success through learning. Yes. It was dissonance and success both yes, in that. Yes. In the first place, you hit me with a lot of dissonance. I was uncomfortable yes. because, you know, I've been a PhD, I'm an, uh, I'm an auditor, <coughs> and I now have to go and listen yep. to people. doesn't happen. But time and again, I saw the success. Hmm. I saw the light in people's eyes. I saw yep. the welcoming gestures yes. to say, oh, this man wants to listen. Come, yep. let's sit down. Yes. So I think that's what gave me the... the, the, uh, the success. I mean, that's yep. what I really enjoy now about social psychology of risk. Yeah. It's, I it, think it's interesting you say that, Nippon. In the 20 odd years I've been doing this, I've never met anyone who knows um, how to listen with a method. Some people are good at listening naturally. They do it intuitively and they're quite good at it. They can't tell you what they're doing, but they know they're doing it. But those people are very rare. They'd be less than 1% of the general population. Most of the time, you actually have to be taught how to listen from a disposition of wanting to listen. So you actually have to have an ethic before you even start that says, this world is not about myself. This world is about a community of others. And you can't even learn how to listen unless you take that disposition. And particularly in industries that are measurement-centric, it's never about the self. It's always about 
measuring the other, controlling an object or something like that. And so many, many times that people have come to me and I've done uh, training programs on culture and communication, no one knows how to listen. They, they actually have no method. And so when I learned that very, very early, about 20 years ago, I started writing methods to help people listen because in some ways it's like helping a child ride a bike. They've never done it before. How do they start? Oh, with small little steps of learning until they can get good at it. And I have found in some of these organisations it takes years, not months, to turn leaders, senior managers, supervisors into effective listeners. And when they become effective listeners, the culture starts to change. But they need tools and methods for it, so I made them up to help them do that. Um, you could call them guidelines, you could call them prompts of some sort. And there always gets to the stage where there are people who simply don't want to. It's much, much easier, much, much more efficient to just tell someone something and then police it. Very, very efficient. And that's what the risk and safety industry does. I give you information, you don't do what you're told, you're now policed. Um, it takes longer to learn how to listen, but the longitudinal outcomes are immense, are immense.